Welcome for the second Sunday of this festival, Milwaukee Film Festival 2023, is presented by Associated Bank. I am so glad all of you are here today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and just jump right in, and I would love to introduce all of you to today's moderator, Willie Westone. He is the post-production film exec at AMC. All right, thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you guys for coming out on this chilly but very cool afternoon in Milwaukee. Um, and we're just gonna jump right into it. The uh, topic for today's panel discussion is, so you've made a film, now what? Literally, that's it. So you've made a film, now what? This is definitely a panel for filmmakers and film buffs alike. And I was initially gonna introduce our panelists, but I think it'll be exciting to let them introduce themselves first. <laughs> So take it away, Clay, and we'll just work our way. Thank you so way. much. <laughs> um, my name is Clay Pruitt. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, my, I, my title at my job is Director of Programming in, uh, Impact Distribution at Seed and Spark, um, which many filmmakers may know primarily as a crowdfunding platform. Um, I work on the other side of the company, which is more on the impact distribution focused um, directly into corporations. Um, so that's my, primarily my bread and butter, but I also am a producer, um, independent filmmaker. Hi, I'm Livia Huang. I'm a filmmaker and I'm also an associate programmer at America Reframed, which airs on World Channel, which is made by WGBH in Boston. And it's also co-produced by American Documentary, home to our sister series POV and POV Shorts. Hi, I'm Mai Hong. Um, I am very out of place on this panel with these very esteemed guests, uh, as I am the director of a movie called Cat Daddies. <laughs> um, I'm gonna blow up, I said I wasn't gonna blow up my spot. I was gonna put her in the hot seat. Um, but uh, my, I actually want to start with you because you actually self-released Cat Daddies and uh, you saw, you had some very rare success because you self-released um, and it was a theatrical release and Cat Daddies has screened in over 60 theaters worldwide and has made over, has grossed over $110,000. So um, I want to start off by just asking you um, what your process was like, um, if and why you chose to self-release um, after making this film, if you wouldn't mind starting us off talking about that. Yeah, um, so technically, like it's kind of a hybrid distribution model. Um, I actually, I, I always knew I was gonna do a theatrical. I had done it before. This is my first documentary feature, but I've produced with my husband, who's a filmmaker, and he has um, distributed, like made small indie films from $25,000 to quarter million. And, you know, and I, I've, I've been through the process with him, seeing how he distributes that. And we've actually theatrically self-released one of his films um, before. So I kind of been down the road and kind of knew what we need to do. Also my background before, really getting into filmmaking was actually film festivals. So I was running film festivals, so yeah. And um, so I, my background was, you know, a decade of that, of like getting people into seats. So that was kind of what I knew how to do. And so using all that, I knew from the beginning I wanted to do this. I know, which, I know it sounds silly because it's a cat documentary, but, but I partly want to do it as a cat lover because I know how it feels to watch that content with other cat lovers and it's really magical. Um, and you know, I mean, what filmmaker doesn't want the theatrical experience? So, so we did that and um, I, I just kind of, I used kind of the film festival run too as kind of a test that confirmed my feeling that I should go, I should, you know, do this. And so I did it even though it's crazy and I would tell people not to do it. And then if you still want to do it, okay, fine, let's talk. But, <laughs> but it is a lot because it's like you said, like box office was great for that time as people are still going back into the theaters. 
and at times there were weekends where like my per theater average was like number two in the country, like under, yeah. like below Avatar two, so, and and like and it still was frustrating to get my movie out there into more more theaters. And then I also had a um, somewhat traditional distributor, boutique distributor, handle uh, U.S. Uh, you know, everything, uh, educational, VOD, all that. So I just carved out my theatrical rights in the U.S. Nice. And then also my sales agent, which is my first time working with a sales agent, um, is took it out, glo you know, to the markets to sell it globally. So we, we've sold about 10 territories and yeah. it's still going. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the process of having a sales agent? Like, did you know to look for, for one or... I, I, I did cold, cold call some um, sales agents that were very reputable. You've probably heard of them too. But they're pretty much, my feeling and what I've heard is they're not interested unless you get into a Sundance or South By or Tribeca. And other than that, if you don't have that, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I knew I wasn't going to get a response, and I didn't. But... Um, uh, actually, my sales agent found me in the program lineup of Tallgrass Film Festival, <laughs> which is Melanie. She's on the next panel. Um, it's her festival, and uh, so yeah, they 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 saw some international value in it, and so um, so we joined up. I love that because it's been kind of a motif in conversations throughout this weekend where people are discussing the importance of. You know, yes, you have your Sundance and your Tribeca film festivals, but uh, the quote unquote smaller or mid tier festivals can produce some great results. You can make some fantastic, you meet some fantastic people. Um, so I love that that happened for you. And also, as a person who has raised cats for 10 years, I just want to say thank you. Two cats for 10 years, thank you for, uh, for making this talk. Um, I want to ask both Clay and Livia, because you both are programmers. Um, can you talk to us about what you're looking for? So like when you guys are um, selecting content or talking to filmmakers, what are some things that stand out um, where you're like, you know what, like this, are you basically looking at just the content itself? Or are you looking at the filmmaker? Can you talk to us about the, your process as programmers? Yeah, so I can speak about what America Refrained, which is a public media documentary series looks for. Um, we scout and have a heavy presence in all the usual like big domestic festivals that you would think of but then also regional festivals and like um festivals aimed at uplifting underrepresented voices because our series from the beginning has been about films that challenge the american project that reshape what we think of when we think of america and it's really important to us that the filmmakers have a strong tie to the communities they're representing like a, a stake a vested interest um so the who the filmmaker is and their connection to the story is really important to us. And we think, we try to curate like a slate that is appealing to as many people as possible. So we always try to program like not just according to like race, gender, but also disability, labor. Um, and that's just really important to us. In terms of um, my sister series at POV, they look at also international films. And so they're hitting up like IDFA, CPH Docs, um, more of that kind. Um, and we will also share screeners. They'll pass us along filmmakers that they're really interested in but like don't have room for. Um, so it does depend on the series. But I think that generally the mandate of public media is to, the public media is really aware of what it provides that like a private streamer doesn't. Because public media won't pay filmmakers the way that HBO or Netflix will. but. It will advance your goals as a filmmaker if your goal is to reach a certain kind of audience. If you're interested in accessibility where it's free, it's a national broadcast to people that might not be able to afford internet. Um, and I think I was just telling, um, uh, let's do that, with that um, Willie. for example, sorry. <laughs> Willie, it's okay. No. Willie. Um, we met with uh, filmmakers um, that were formerly incarcerated and they talked about how they were able to watch America Refrained while they were incarcerated and that was super important and meaningful to us. So I think that's just like our mandate. I don't know how to follow that up. <laughs> um, so specifically with my work at Seed and Spark, um, I work 
uh, on a product called Film Forward, which um, is essentially a technology solution to uh, uh, kind of work working with learning and development uh, heads of HR and stuff in corporations um, to build more inclusive and empathetic workforces, leveraging short films as sort of the conduit to the conversation. Um, so when I'm what I'm looking for, what I'm curating for is largely driven by like the curriculum that we're building and sort of the different um, topics that we want to address. Um, so some of that is, is it kind of goes both ways. Some of it is curriculum driven. Some of it is like I find an incredible film that I know is going to have a huge impact on an audience that would never otherwise see it. Um, and then we sort of figure out how to build a curriculum around it. Um, and uh, I just want to go back to you know what you were saying about um, providing access to people uh, is so important, and like and also giving them an opportunity to see something that they never otherwise would. Also, from a filmmaking perspective, like the average American audience, from my perspective, I'm mostly programming shorts. How many Americans normally sit down in their houses and watch short films? Like, not much. But if your work is like, hey, we're doing this thing and you need to watch a short film every month, then not only are we getting that film in a place that it never otherwise would be, um, but it's also like opening avenues for audiences to be like, hey, shorts are great. Like, I want to find more of these on PBS or in other forums. So I, that's not answering your question, but I just wanted to piggyback on that. Clay, we, we were talking before um, just about the distribution process and um, how deciding what type of filmmaker you want to be really ties into that, you know, like, obviously, yes, everybody wants to be able to, like, pay their rent and make a living, um, folks got to eat, um, but can you just kind of touch on what you had said earlier um, as far as, like, when you are deciding to become a filmmaker and how that kind of relates to distribution? Um, so, <laughs> I mean, there is sort of two two parts of that question. One is like, what kind of filmmaker do you want to be? Um, and also, it's kind of project dependent, right? Because um, you know, the same filmmaker can have very very different projects from one to the next with different goals in mind. Um, I was just uh, teaching a workshop earlier this morning about crowdfunding and a huge part of how a huge part of that is really understanding who your audience is for the thing that you're making and how important it is to do that long before you even set out to do make the, the thing because it'll help you in fundraising but it'll also help you figure out where your distribution pathways are so if you are if your goal with that project is to change the world then you're going to approach your fundraising, your filming, your partnerships, your distribution pathway is very different than if you're like, I want to make money on this thing. Um, that's gonna that's gonna direct your all of your decisions. Um, but it's so it's and it's not to say that you have to choose one path. You can very much like set out to make an incredible documentary, and then when you see that it's resonating with audiences and has a real power, then you can decide, like, oh, maybe I should raise money to do an impact campaign with this and go a different route with it. But it is important to sort of understand very clearly like who your audience is and how that aligns with your goals. That definitely makes sense. And to kind of like um, add to that question, like my, for you as a filmmaker, um, at what part in the process do you start thinking about distribution? Is it right from the beginning when you're, you know, uh, making the film? Is it after? Is it during post-production? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I think early on you should think about a plan B. So you have like your dream plan, right? Oh, I'm going to get into this festival. Then it's going to get sold to a distributor. And then I can just sit back and relax and work on my next project. And it's never going to be like that. That's kind of like winning the lottery. And even if you do get that distributor, it's still going to be a lot of work for you after the fact. So I feel like if you want to go the indie route, like, and, and like, for me, the indie route is so important because I want to maintain control. I don't really want to be told by a streamer or whoever who I can cast, you know, what kind of, they all have their own like algorithms of like, at minute five, you need to have this. And at minute 15, you have to have this, you know, and like, I don't want to deal with that. So 
I, I'm really very much independent spirit all the way through, and so um, I knew that uh, I had to have another plan if the dream plan didn't work out. So I think you need to think about that early on. And there's so many ways to do it, and there's no one right path, and it really is project specific on what distribution path you're going to have. Um, for me, it was like, I don't know, people kept telling me like, oh, well, you know, one in three households has a cat, therefore you're gonna make a ton of money. And that's not true because I'm learning that it is so hard to get people, as now everybody is so used to streaming, like nobody wants to pay for anything. So nobody's gonna, if you don't get on a streamer, nobody's gonna pay that $5 or whever to rent your movie. So first you gotta get the cat lovers who will do that, you know, um, and that's, that's just hard. Everybody's, everybody like has cat content on their phone, on TikTok, whatever. Um, Is that what you were saying before you would kind of like usher people, usher filmmakers away from kind of just seeking the theatrical release route or does it have? Partly, partly. I think because no one understands just how much money and effort and energy takes. I've spent way more time and money distributing my movie than the making of it. Ooh. I reverse engineered a little bit my movie so that it was very, very cheap and expensive to make. I did, had a lot of friend favors. You know, my, I didn't hire a sound guy. I made my husband do the sound. He had never literally used a boom in his life, but I'm like, here. Here's a Zoom recorder, figure it out. And, and he also edited my movie. So, I mean, like, free labor. So if you're not you know, married to another filmmaker, it's gonna be tough. And then just the marketing expenses and just the, the, all the middlemen that are involved into getting your movie up on Amazon, which my movie is up on Amazon, by the way. Um, if they take so much of the pie, you're really not left with much. So when you're doing a theatrical, you really are kind of spending $10 to make $3, if that makes sense. And, and that's ended up what happening. So even though like, oh, I had this great box office return for a documentary called Cat Daddies. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't get much of that in return because it took so much to get the word out. Because just because it's there doesn't mean anybody's going to find it. And just because there are cat people doesn't mean they're going to get out of their house and pay the money. Yeah. It's like <laughs> the marketing. Yeah. The marketing never really stops. It never it. stops. Yeah. And I'm still yeah. doing it now. And I'm working on a DVD release and making bonus features. And I'm having to put my own money into making those bonus features. So it's never ending. So. Yeah, no life-changing money yet, and I've, I've been, I started my project in 2019, and I just keep pouring money, you know, travel to film festivals, all this stuff, it adds up, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you don't get in the game to get rich, <laughs> but valid. if you're lucky, you get in the game so you make enough money to make the next one. Nice. That's the hope. Since we're um, on, kind of on the topic of like uh, AVOD and SVOD, so like AVOD is advertising video on demand and SVOD subscription based video on demand. Um, Maya, you kind of touched on it, but um, uh, Olivia and Clay, um, what kind of advice would you guys have for filmmakers um, when it comes to handling streaming and whether it's the best route to go? Um, any do's or don'ts? Um, so for public media, we'll ask most of the series, I'm thinking of Independent Lens, POV, and America Refrained, we'll ask for streaming. It used to be that, um, for example, Minding the Gap, the bigger streamers would be willing to share. Um, that's kind of not the case as much anymore, although some of the smaller streamers like Criterion or Kino Lorber will still share. Um, and then it varies by series and also by film in terms of how you negotiate your streaming. Um, but standard for America Refrain would be like a four-year broadcast um, with multiple rebroadcasts throughout that four-year term and multiple windows of streaming throughout as well um, because we're really interested in getting your movie out there as much as possible. Um, and we feel like that's like also part of the advantage of public media is just that it's free. Um, you don't need a membership, you don't need to sign up, you can just go to the website and watch it. Um, 
I have so many thoughts on this. Um, first of all, the whole streaming space, if you're paying attention at all, is like in absolute turmoil right now. Um, so, uh, I mean, kind of top to bottom. So definitely pay attention to the trades and what is going on and the, the consolidations that are happening and what is what the moves are happening because it does affect you. Um, I have found that there are kind of a lot of gatekeepers in the space um, and especially, you know, right now kind of AVOD is, is king. Um, it seems to be the one that the part of the streaming world that is growing the most and the most stable at the moment. Um, like Tubi is, I, I can't even re remember the stats of how quickly they're growing right now. Um, but they, uh, their sort of model is really buying from an aggregator. Um, so it's some, that somebody like a Gravitas or, you know, somebody who has like a massive library of titles that they've picked up at, fe at market festivals um, that you are just one of many. Um, and if, you know, that's sort of the way into to those opportunities um, because they just don't have the bandwidth or the, or the manpower to individually look at a lot of films. They're just buying large libraries because it's growth at all costs. Um, and that kind of sucks as an independent filmmaker because you are really just, just kind of a, a, num a dollar sign <laughs> or a potential dollar sign, right? And the other kind of crappy thing about that, unfortunately, is that a lot of the, the way that the deals are structured, a lot of filmmakers may end up going with an aggregator like that and never see a dime because it's based on, they have to recoup all of their costs first um, before they, you even get to the revenue, revenue share. Um, so I guess my advice, and that was a big downer statement, sorry. <laughs> um, but I guess my advice um, is really uh, use your community. Um, how many people have like an IMDB Pro account? Great, so that's like, a relatively useful tool for finding uh, contact information. Um, if you are considering approaching or you have been approached by um, an aggregator or a sales agent or whatever, um, see who else they've worked with and contact them. And see, I guarantee you other independent filmmakers will be very willing to talk to you about how it went for them, what was good, what was bad, and that'll really inform your decision. And like, that's the situation where you might end up being like, I'm gonna release this theatrically myself because I can be in control, I, I know where my audience is, um, you know, maybe it's not theatrically, maybe you end up doing a Vimeo on demand transactional situation or iTunes or, what, or whatever. Um, but just inform yourself in, in those decisions because streaming seems like king because that is where we all watch most of our content, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> um, and it's also not always the best way to, to set your project up. And then those, those contracts end up being for many, many years and you're kind of locked into them. Um, so that's my advice, it was very long-winded. <laughs> Oh, just piggybacking off of you, Clay. Um, yeah, uh, there is a Facebook group that I uh, recommend. It's called, if, if you, you can join, it's for filmmakers and not for distributors. It's called Protect Yourself from Predatory Film Distributors slash Aggregators. Um, if you're, you know, trying to, trying to get some scoop on, you know, whether this is a good distributor or sales agent, you can search that group and see what other people have said. So um, I just posted about my sales agent and my exper experience on there and there's a, um, there's a lot of rants too, but I mean, <laughs> you know, that comes with the territory, but um, that's been really helpful for me and you can also connect with other people. And I also think that if you do try to connect with filmmakers out there to get a reference or, you know, ask for their advice, um, you know, uh, at least please acknowledge them or I get so many emails where people don't even acknowledge they got my long reply or yeah. thank me. And I think like at the, at the barest minimum, at least try to like rent their movie on Amazon or something. You don't have to watch it. Just like, just it's Give a couple of bucks, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they used to, you used to have to take someone out for coffee, you know, and now they don't do that. But yeah, I mean, if they spend the time uh, answering you, at least acknowledge them. 
really good. Um, and I like that you guys are getting down to the nitty gritty because um, I really wanted to ask, um, especially because of how rough times are for the industry as a whole, um, just like any words of wisdom or advice, um, not just with distribution, but just with filmmaking in general, um, what I've been hearing a lot of is just like having the right people behind you, having the right team, like finding community. Um, so, and Maya, you kind of touched on it because, you know, your husband is a filmmaker, so it was very much like all hands on deck. Um, but for you, Clay, and you, Olivia, because um, you're both filmmakers as well, do you have any, um, I guess, words of wisdom as, as filmmakers when it comes to that? You go first. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Words of wisdom specifically around what? Just about uh, filmmaking as a whole. So like we're talking about the distribution process in general. Like are there any, is there anything else that people, filmmakers should be thinking about besides just writing and directing? Um, I mean, storytelling is a incredibly powerful thing in, especially in today's society when truth does not exist um, <laughs> well when we can't agree on what truth is storytelling is really the most impactful and and um, uh, strongest way to create change um, so I think just trusting in yourself building a great team of support um, around you and like honestly the most successful filmmakers that I have seen and also the most successful projects that I have made have been the most emblematic of why my voice is unique. So just really leaning into what makes me unique as a filmmaker. Um, and it's the same with all of the success stories you see out there is because they really know who they, who their vo what their voice is and who they are. Um, and they do, they've just become exceptionally well at honing that. Um, it is a crowded space in, especially as technology has evolved, like so many people are making content now. There's so many different avenues to get that content out there that even if you do, how are people gonna find it, right? Like you said this before, my, like um, you have to, to, how are you gonna rise out in the crowd? How are you gonna the st stand out in the crowd? Um, and that, and that I think the, the tried and true, the only way proven way to do that is just like be as authentically yourself as you possibly can. That's great. Yeah, I have to piggyback off of Clay. I feel like what I've seen be most useful is an awareness of where you, of what you specifically are trying to do with your project and where it fits in into the ecosystem of perhaps comparable projects, having a long view of what you want your career to look like long term. I'm thinking about in my work, right, like we we often we try to bet on filmmakers, like not just the films themselves, because specifically in my series, we're usually like the calling card for like an emerging filmmaker, and then they go on to do other stuff. Like Sarah Dosa from Fire of Love, her first film was with us. The Knock Down the House, I'm forgetting the filmmaker, but his first thing was with us as well. And in terms of my personal practice, like I think of, I had an opportunity to get my short um, on this DVD series by this reputable um, British distributor, and I was really excited by it, um, this compilation. And I thought it was really cool, and I liked the projects they picked, but I just felt kind of uh, unsettled by the term length, um, and so I ultimately decided not to go with it. And then it turned out to be great because the first big grant I got, one of the um, qualifications was that you couldn't have already gone distribution. So I would have been disqualified from like my first major grant if I had gone with that. So, and I think that was just like a feeling I had about like, I don't want to be locked into this necessarily. And that was, who, who could tell you that but yourself, right? So that's your own intuition. Nice. Mm. Oh. Do you have anything? So that, if you don't want to add, that's oh, fine. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I like to advise, a lot of filmmakers ask me about like what film festival to, um, to submit to, and my answer is actually always, and this helps with distribution too, like submit to the ones that you really want to attend, you know, and attend it. You know, whether it's, you want to go so bad, you're willing to like put your travel on a credit card, or you have a friend to stay with in this place, 
narrow it down to that, you know, the ones that you actually have, because attending and being in person like opens up doors, um, connections with other people who can then help you later if you are doing some kind of, um, even if it's not theatrical, even if you're doing a VOD or something like that. I mean, I got, I, I got a, my uh, sponsor for my theatrical um, release from a brand, from a company, um, just from being at the festival, and I guess they thought I was approachable, so they later emailed me, and um, we started, we forged a relationship over that. And also, if you're comfortable with social media, I know not everybody is, but it, if you have an audience, you can kind of like target, whether it's cats, or it's beer, or it's like whatever. Um, if you can use social media to start a community, it is so helpful, and every time like you go to a festival or you have some kind of news, um, that engagement is just so important that people see something going on. Yeah. And um, also, you have to be so excited about your project because no one's gonna care about your film more than you. So if, you, if your excitement isn't here, <laughs> You know, and it's here, everybody else's is going to be below that. So your excitement, you know, has to be really high. And plus, you're going to be doing this for, you know, a couple of years, yeah. you know. So it's a couple of years of your life, and it'll consume you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are giving us some, some wise words. Um, I do want to take a minute to see if anybody in the audience has any questions. Um, that they'd like to bring up, whether about distribution or anything else. Uh, I'm just gonna w walk over here. Um, if you could state your name and um, who you are and... Yeah. Sure, hi everyone, I'm Scott. I have a film here, it's called Pear Die. Rachel and I are the directors of it. Um, my question is, just after reviewing the trades and kind of trying to keep up with what's going on and all the mergers, it seems as though that distributors are acquiring films less and less and less, and especially independent films. I mean, films are not being bought out of festivals like they used to be. And my question to you is, what do you see the future as for independent filmmakers? Are distributors wanting to get involved much earlier in the process before we finish the film? Um, and, and how to think about making our next film? Is it to try to finish the film or try to sell them on a pitch deck of an idea of a film? I'd say if you have that connection to go straight to distributor, go for that. I'm coming from a place where I didn't have any of that. Um, so, so that's, you know, I think in the future, I'm actually thinking about, you know, I mean, I'll see how, it's too early to tell how my distribution, VOD distribution is. They keep telling me it's going well, and, but I don't have anything to compare that to. So it's like, okay, I'll take your word for it. But, but I think, you know, I may, you know, you could, it depends on the movie. Like if you don't feel like you have an international uh, audience for your movie, don't waste your time going, trying to get a sales agent because there's nothing they can do with that. Um, and their expenses are so high, usually, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars, even if they do sell your movie to a couple of territories, that's it. You're not going to see any money. They have to be able to sell it to like six, eight territories and get a minimum guarantee from those, those territories in order for you to see any of that money. So I don't know why a lot of people think they need a sales agent. It just really depends on the project. And then distributor, like same thing. Like if you don't feel like you're, you know, if if no one feels strongly that you're going to do really well at on, you know, Amazon or whatever, then maybe you should then go for an aggregator. And then then you're keeping, you know, there's some aggregators. I believe you could be keeping 80 percent. Um, you maybe pay them a couple of thousand dollars to get it on the platform and all that. And there may be like E and O insurance involved, but but you'll keep more of the pie at the end. But also, what does that mean? It means nobody's really marketing your movie except you. So how do people know about it out there? And another thing I I want to add that I discovered in my experience was that um, publicity is no longer really there. Nobody's reviewing movies. That's that's another problem. Um, and that's not just for movies going theatrically, that's VOD too. So like how, you know, a lot of these movie, I mean the other all be always be film bloggers, but what about all these mainstream 
film reviewers, they're not, they're not writing about indie film anymore. And so that was a huge roadblock for me because my movie was called Cat Daddies. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Thank you, by the way, that was, oh. Do you wanna add to that? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, we met at um, Gotham Project Market last year, yeah. Um, I can only really speak to public media, but I know, I think people expect to like, in the same way that you make a friend, you have to like spend a certain amount of time with them or you have to see them a certain number of times. I think that's kind of how, from what I've observed, people in public media act. Like they want to have seen you a few times throughout the process of you making the film. And so you, as far as I know, you're doing everything right already. Like we met you last year talking about your project with the rough cut. And I think because the pool of filmmakers that are interested in public media is generally a small pool, public media series are like always keeping on top of like, what's a new project coming out? Like, oh, I've heard about this one. It's at a rough cut stage. I'll send you the cut. Like there's a lot of passing around of information. So you're already doing the right thing for that. I have no idea of it, like HBO or whatever. Do we have any other questions for the panelists? avenues for animation distribution, especially shorts. Well, you, you're shorts. Uh, <laughs> I am shorts, you're right. <laughs> um, I mean, for me specifically, like, for what I look for, it doesn't matter what the format is, if it's animation, uh, scripted or unscripted, um, as long as the, the story is sort of like in line with sort of what I'm specifically looking for, and I think that probably goes for um, a lot of shorts distributors is sort of like whatever whatever they're looking for. I will say that like shorts in general, like in the US, not a lot of opportunities. Uh, in Europe, a lot more opportunities. So if you can manage to get your short, especially into like a short festival that has a market, so like Palm Springs Short Fest, um, Claremont Ferrand in France, um, there's a much higher chance that you might get some distribution opportunities out of that, um, which I don't think a lot of people in, end up making a short thinking that they're gonna make money on it. Um, but it does happen in those, those situations. Um, and that's one of the w things that we're, we're hoping to change is provide a monetized outlet for short filmmakers. Um, and I do think that might change over time um, in, as the streamers figure out what the hell they're doing. <laughs> um, but um, I, I mean, it sort, of, it sort of depends on your goals. Um, if you just want it to get seen, then festivals for sure, and, and definitely those targeted um, shorts, shorts festivals. Um, there's some buyers, I know that like, well, I don't think they do this anymore, but like Neon um, used to buy shorts. Um, I don't think they, they do it anymore. Um, Searchlight has been known to pick up a short or two. Um, that's usually as part of a deal that they make with the filmmaker for like a first look deal, because they, they like what they've seen and it's sort of like first right of refusal of their next project. Um, I don't know how much that goes for animation, but um, it is a great, I mean, festivals in general, I do know a lot of people who work in animate, like animated series, which is the sort of the main money driving outlet in America, at least. I do know a lot of folks that work at those entities that go to festivals to look for new voices in animation. Um, and I know, I know several animators and animation filmmakers that have gotten work out of that. So. Um, it might not be this project specifically that is going to be the launch pad, but it may be, you know, um, or sorry, the money driver, but it may be a, a conduit to the next thing. There's something to add. Yeah. Um, just because your question made me think, um, I know that the, the head programmer for the Berlin Ollie shorts used to be an experimental animator, so she really likes animated shorts. And I know that some of, and they always program some really cool animated shorts every year. And then I, I think I'm trying to, remember where they ended up. At least one that I really liked was bought by um, Nowness, which is like a, a website, but they, they um, promote short works a lot. Um, and then the other one I was thinking about was like South by for like the American animation market. Berlinale? 
Are there any other questions? Yes. Thanks. Um, if you're interested or, I mean, if you have a dream to have your work showed on a platform like Criterion, how would you go about that? Like, do you have any advice if you, I mean, yeah, if you don't have a sales agent or maybe even if you do? I, I know the person who was the director of programming for Criterion for nine years and she only recently left. Um, and I should know a better answer to this question because she's a good friend. Um, but um, but uh, Criterion is very specific. Like there is such a niche distributor that it really is the, the taste of the programmer um, who is going to sort of decide to pursue it or not. Um, I don't know what they, if they have a submission process. There's, does anybody follow Dear Producer? Yeah. Okay. So Dear Producer is a really incredible website um, that was started by Rebecca Green. Um, and it's sort of a blog, but it's, they also do like events and um, she's sort of spearheading a producer's union. Uh, she's in, an incredible person. <laughs> um, but they've done this thing, and I think they do it every year, where they, um, they go around to all the indie distributors, um, platforms as well as theatrical and like other entities, and ask them sort of the same set of questions, which is like, what are you looking for? How many are you acquiring on an annual basis? What is your submission process? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long list, and it's very thorough, and it's excellent. Um, some of them I was surprised. I was like, oh, you gave your email. Like, I can just send a film to you. Great. I had no idea that I could do that. You know, So there are some of those things. That I'm sure Criterion's on there, and I'm sure it specifies what their, their thing is. I know that they are a festival-heavy programming entity, so they are, and, but you can probably do some research and figure out what are the common festivals that they are going to, and like, then you can target your festival strategy if that's really the end goal for you, like be in those places. It's also probably gonna align with what kind of audience your film is anyway, is, is, uh, uh, associates with anyway, so. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but <laughs> it's the best I could do. Yeah. Super helpful. Um, uh, so this is gonna be our final thing. Um, if you guys have anything that you wanna plug, uh, my marketing is never done for that movie. Um, and also if you feel like it, um, sharing your contact info or how folks can get in touch with you. Um. Uh, yeah, if you wanna see my journey, um, it's all on Instagram. I document it way too thoroughly on at Cat Daddy's movie. And uh, also to note, I actually edited on a movie, a documentary that's in the festival showing on Tuesday, and it's also virtual. So if you want to check out Finding Satoshi, it was actually one of those gigs that helped me pay my bills while I was, <laughs> um, you know, getting this my own movie out there. But um, I'm happy with how it turned out, and you never know. Um, how how that like a work for hire gig can be and I'm actually it's narrated by Willem Dafoe and um, I don't want to tell you too much about you should go in not knowing what it's about but it's um, it's mainly about the internet and it's very heartwarming and um, it it's shot all over you know many many different countries all over the world and and check it out yeah Finding Satoshi um, I was one of the editors on it um, I'll plug my series America Reframed you can email me, it's just, um, what is my email? lhuang at amdoc.org. So just first initial, then last name at amdoc.org if you have a feature length documentary. Although now we're taking some shorts, but that's less clear to me. We take feature <laughs> documentaries about America in some way. Um, if any of you have jobs at corp in corporations <laughs> that are looking for some um, opportunities to get film into your workplace culture, um, filmforward.io is the um, product that I specifically work on. Um, from a personal standpoint, you can follow me on uh, Instagram. My, it's my full name, Clay Marshall Pruitt. Um, and I'm not on there a lot these days. Uh, hopefully that's gonna change once I ramp up on some more personal projects. Um, and I think the other thing I will just plug is the amazing programming at this festival. Um, 
they've done an incredible, incredible job. So see as much as you can. I was in a screening on Friday night that uh, Jack was moderating or uh, in- introing, and he had the audience raise their hands for how many films they'd seen. There were people at that screening that had this was their 32nd film that they had seen in the festival. So, challenge. <laughs> well, thank you guys again. Can we give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you. And thank you to the Milwaukee Film Festival for hosting this, and also to Pomona Cider Company for hosting us as well. Um, thank you guys. That's it. All right, let's get, let's get you guys cidered up. <laughs>